Hi, everybody, and welcome to another Playful Humans podcast. I'm your host, Mike Montague, and my guest this week is Maria Brito. She is an artist and author of How Creativity Rules the World. You can check out the new book at mariabrito.com slash book. And there's some special offers there that you can check out and uh, get the links to buy the book as well. Uh, I'll also check out her artwork. It's been featured in Vogue and Elle magazine and Goop and all kinds of uh, cool stuff around the world, partnerships and collaboration on uh, different fashion and merchandise too. We're gonna talk about that. And we're gonna remind you to rediscover the power of play and creativity in your life. You can do that at playfulhumans.com. Here we go. All right, Maria, we like to start with the joke of the week. The joke of the week this week is brought to you by Impressions. When I told my nephew, uh, my ne sorry, my nephew told me <laughs> to stop impersonating a flamingo, I had to put my foot down. Oh. Uh, <laughs> all right, here's the official joke of the week. Uh, why was the office of cantaloupes so glum? Why? Because they were melon colleagues. <laughs> <laughs> All right, not the best ones uh, I've been on on the show, I'll be honest, but uh, do you have a joke for us? Well, you know that I invented a word. Uh, what's that? Plagiarism. <laughs> there you go, I like that one. Uh, that's good too. Uh, all right. Well, let's just start with your career. You made a, a big pivot, uh, what, like 13, 15 years ago now 13. In, in your career. Yeah. Uh, tell me about it. You know, I uh, I was a corporate attorney, and this was because I was following a predictable path that was set out by my parents who wanted me to, according to them, be successful. But I was born a performer, really. I wanted to be on stages singing, dancing, potentially acting too, and things like that. But that was out of the question for my parents because they were not going to support me. And I grew up in Venezuela, which is a country that had no real support for the arts or anything like that and much less for what I wanted to do so I think I believed my parents obviously because you are a child and you hear the same story every day so it's a lot of brainwashing and a lot of uh, indoctrination if you will and so when I decided that I was going to become an attorney because I didn't want to be a doctor I mean there were the options were like doctor uh, engineer um, you know, lawyer. And that was pretty much what it was like, what they had told me I wanted to do. You know, they decided for me. So I, I went to law school and I, uh, went to Harvard law and I, it was like, I mean, the stakes were really high. I really did everything that I was meant to do to, to have that successful career. And I moved to New York city in year 2000 and I, uh, passed the bar practiced in, uh, big law firms for uh, about nine years. And I, you know, I, at the beginning you try because it's really like, it's something new and you want to obviously mine your career and what you've done and all the years of education and whatnot, but I was miserable, right? And so I always try to figure out ways of making myself like not see that reality, right? It's like, oh my God, they pay me so well. It's very stable. It, it, you know, I'm not going to get fired because I'm working so hard and I'm like, you know, uh, valuable and I know what I'm doing yet. I hate it. So when I had my first child, I really went, I, I had already had this concerns and I went really deep and I said, you know, I just really can't do this uh, thing anymore. And I decided that I want to do, I, I want to clarify something. I'm not an artist or, or maybe I am, but what I do is I'm an art advisor and a curator. So what I yeah. do is I help people build art collections. Uh, but I like that you say that I'm an artist because I think I am too in a way because an artist doesn't necessarily circumscribe to the person who's actually in front of a canvas. Right. Everybody is an artist, right? I mean, like it, art is a form of communication where you actually transmit something from within, right? And so I, I transitioned into this new business. And, you know, if you guys are like wondering what does an art advisor do, I didn't even know that exists. So what I do is I, I help people and companies build 
art collections. And so I am the eyes on the ground, I'm the ears, I'm the one who chooses what to buy. I am the one who presents new artists to them. I'm the one who says, this is the one that you need or this is what you're missing. And it's all kind of uh, attuned to who they are, how they feel. And, you know, it's been absolutely incredible what has, has happened to me because as I made such a dramatic shift, you would have expected that, you know, I mean, it could have been a flop or something. And it really has been the most successful thing in my life, really. Um, and I think that happens when you become honest and that you have a passion and purpose, things materialize in a way that you never could have foreseen. Because the things that have happened to me in this career, I never even dreamt they were going to happen for me, right? Like, I mean, I, I had a really big vision, the truth is, and it was incredibly ambitious, but as the thing moved forward and every time something new happened, I was like blown away by the support that I had gotten from the universe, if you will, right? I mean, it sounds woo, but I don't have any more words to explain something that it was the combination of me wanting to do something amazing with purpose and service to the world and the world actually meeting me where I was. Well, I think that's huge. And there's so much to unpack there because I, I agree with all of it. So I don't want to just repeat what you said, but, <laughs> but I think that last one is interesting because some people feel like it is, you know, woo woo or something. I don't know that it's necessarily anything spiritual for me as much as it is like synergistic that people recognize when you're working in your area of passion and strength. And if you're not in that into being a, a corporate attorney, nothing's gonna take off for you. You might get lucky and win the lottery or, or something, but if you're not putting out the vibes of happiness and passion and, and shooting for big goals and waking up with that fire, like you're you know, a kid going to Disneyland, when the, you act like that, people will notice and pay attention and opportunities come to you and are, are attracted to that uh, because you're putting a different vibe out in, into the world. And I, I think that can be scientific too. If you really, people have studied it, right? That when you're excited about stuff, you see opportunities other people don't see when they're not excited. You work through challenges and overcome obstacles and you make connections uh, better because you're smiling more and you're, you're happy about what you're doing. And so uh, you attract more people and more opportunities. So I think uh, that part is really interesting to me too. But I, I also noticed uh, there that you did the corporate attorney thing for nine years. And I feel like there, uh, so hopefully you at least paid off the student loans and everything. <laughs> set yourself everything up was taken care of. Thank you for asking. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> but uh, So I think that's uh, sometimes a more difficult challenge than if you're a struggling artist or creative the whole time, because you maybe don't get to um, feel what traditional success looks like or, um, in when you are going after that traditional success, it creates traps that these, you know, five weeks of vacation and the salary and things become golden handcuffs that are really hard to, to walk away from. So I guess, uh, tell us about those early transition things. Was it easy for you or, um, and did you like set yourself up to walk away? I'm thinking of people that right now are thinking about doing something like this, yeah. especially in the pandemic and the great resignation that's going on right now. What would you recommend for somebody that wants to take the leap? You know, you've hit a very interesting uh, point because that is the crucial element in the beginning and the first part of my book is about all these transitions and why I did it and offering people tools, encouragement to do it themselves. And there is, I just want to go back to one thing you said. I am on a mission to demystify the whole thing of the struggling creator and the starving artist. And I'm going to tell you why, because I have been in this new business for 13 years and I have never seen artists get so wealthy so fast to have so much demand. And when I say wealthy, I say people who are in like way into the eight figures. Okay. Like, and nice. even more and even more, I mean, and like this was something that even 15 years ago seemed unthinkable. And, and the other thing is that 
We are in the creator economy. We are in a place where people go and make a living out of dancing on TikTok, okay? So I want to, I'm on the mission to demystify all this bullshit of like, no, creative people, creative people, first of all, if you are a, an accountant or you're selling insurance, you can be extremely creative. And actually you need to be, if you want to survive, you have to like yeah. put on your hat of like, I'm an entrepreneur and I am running a business where I'm going to out, outshine all the competition. And that's why you want to be creative. But let me just go back to the real question. Transitions are very difficult. And if I were to be telling you that it was easy, I would be lying. And that's not the objective of my life or my book. It's, um, it's to say that, yes, this these decisions are very, very hard, especially because, like you said, what I, I call all the perks and the vacation and the 401k, which I had, and I had a great insurance and whatnot, I call them barbed wire safety nets, right? Mm -hmm. Because it's like, you have them and, and it's, it's, it's even worse than a golden handcuff, right? I mean, it's like you have them and you, you like, if you move a little bit, you feel them and you feel them all over, right? And if you fall on them, it's like, they are going to make your whole body completely bleeding. Like, it's like crazy. So I, uh, I, I think that what actually got, got me into where I am today was the pain of being an attorney was a whole lot stronger than the uncertainty mm -hmm. of what I was going to be doing next, right? I mean, the the pain of being on that office and the, 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 the work, the tediousness, the hours that were like, you know, 18 hours, yay! You know, people had all this kind of like insanities in their minds saying, oh my God, I pulled three old nighters on a row, I'm so happy happy and whatnot. And I was like, dude, but what is this? You know? And again, I'm telling you, I did it for so long and I had different jobs in different law firms because I was always thinking the next one is going to be better. The next one will yeah. have all the things that I have longed for. Right. And like, the truth is, no, it was just the same with different people. And I look, it's not that I'm ungrateful. I am very grateful of the opportunities and all the things that I learned. I'm very good with my own contracts, for example. You know, I read everything. There you go. Yeah. But uh, that was not for me. And the good thing is that, and for anybody who's listening, whether you are contemplating a career change and you are in your mid 20s, let's say, or if you are in your 70s, it really is never late because you're never be you're never going to be as young as you are right now right like i mean that's the thing like you're never yeah. going to be as young tomorrow you'll be slightly older and so if you want to make a change and you want to pivot you've got to do an inventory uh, of the things that actually light you up and what makes you happy and why you know the whys are very important why do you want to do this because you know oh i want to create a system where uh you know children of unprivileged neighborhoods get access to this and that or i want to be able to work in fashion or i think that there is an opportunity to do something in tech that hasn't been uh you know discovered or it hasn't been exploited or whatever so i I think that the point of doing a radical shift like the one I did is for you to go and have an occupation or a business or a job that actually gets you going, right? It lights you up and it feels like play. And some people might be thinking, well, but that is so radical what you did. I am not able to do that. Okay, I get that. What about a more gradual shift? What about having stages, right? And interim shifts, right? So if you have certain transferable skills to the adjacent industry, to the adjacent job, maybe even within a company, if you work in a company and you can move within that company to a different department, right? And so that's gradually changing. And sooner than you'll know, you'll have accumulated a whole other level of experience that you didn't have before that actually allows you to do another shift. And so this thing sometimes, I mean, look, it took me nine years, right? And it took me nine years first, like to accept that that was wrong. It was the wrong path for me. And to have the honesty to say that, say that to myself and to 
talk to my husband and, you know, to like, and then the world, not that I owed anything to the world, but it was incredible. Imagine coming from the law firm and then saying, okay, hi, here's my website. And this is the new me. That's my new identity. I've left all these things behind. Welcome the new Maria. So that was shocking. <laughs> People did not believe me. People thought I was like, postpartum depression, crazy. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people made fun of me, said I was never going to be able to amount to anything in like this new thing. And I just, you know, of course, the kind of things with the haters and whatnot, and it, it hurts. But at the same time, I had such an intuition that was guiding me and telling me, this is what you have to do. And I never dismissed that voice, even in the face of you know, the worst rejections and the me people made making fun. I, I don't even know where those people are, to be honest. I mean, yeah, I'm I mean, I think where they are is they're still stuck in the Matrix. <laughs> uh, I watched the Matrix, like, you know, reboot uh, here a couple of weeks ago. Uh, and um, I feel like they're they still believe that. Right. And if you believe that it is true. Right. So many people, like you mentioned, are trying to brainwash you that you have to get a good job. You have to uh, have insurance in order to to be safe and and successful or uh, the typical American dreams that we're all brainwashed in movies and TV shows and advertising and our friends and our parents and everything else that it really is tough that there's just not enough people uh, like you, I think, telling the story that art and play and creativity are all viable options. And I agree with you that now more than ever, there is this huge creative middle class where maybe 20, 50 years ago, there were successful artists that were huge and they were, uh, you know, the Beatles or, or uh, <laughs> you know, Michael Jackson or something like that. Uh, but now you can be an unknown musician and make six figures, seven figures and have nobody even ever heard of you, not use a record label, uh, just completely do your own thing. And like you said, be extremely successful. It's this interesting creative middle class that you don't have to be famous and you don't have to be a struggling artist in order to make a career out of it. And I don't think people realize that the game is, has changed. And so that's what I wanted to ask you about next is how creativity rules the world. Because I feel like the more we dive into technology and automation and apps and robots and all kinds of uh, artificial intelligence, we don't need anybody to follow directions anymore. We don't mm -hmm. need a human to be part of an assembly line because we can have computers do that. We need creative connections with human beings to be the next level up job. And so I believe creative professions in whatever you want to call it, play, art, writing, uh, even just you know being a thought leader and, and an innovator creative uh, that to me is more valuable now than it ever has been. Would you agree? Well, that's the title of my book, How Creativity Rules the World, because I, I believe, again, that this book is not just for people who are creative it's, or who consider themselves creatives, right? I mean, let's just talk about that. What is creativity to begin with is your ability to come up with ideas of value that are relevant for what you do and that are novel obviously, right? Because you don't want to come up with an idea that has been done 50 years ago. You want to come up with a new idea that is applicable to what you do. And just going back to the example of the accountant, let's say you're an accountant and you come up with an idea that is going to save money or is a program that has an upgrade that does things faster. Or let's say that you have figured out a way of uh, retaining people that nobody else in the company thought about because you are involved in different aspects and it's just not accounting, right? Right? And so what I, I set out to do really with this book is to bring these ideas to a mass level, right? Because I had taught this concept in companies because they hired me because they couldn't believe the shift that I did, right? And so people are like, how you became so successful doing something when you were 32 that you had absolutely no industry background or proper training. And now you're an industry leader in a 
you know, in, a, in an industry that is really, it's tough. And so companies would hire me. And then I thought, well, how do I create like something easier? So I created a, an online program for people who could not pay 5,000, 10,000 bucks that the companies can pay, right? And so that grew. And then I thought, well, let me just have a book. So people who don't have the 300 bucks for the course, they can have a book that is, you know, $26 a hardcover and $15 an ebook. And so the what people don't well there are a couple of things that people get tripped up the most right one is oh my goodness i'm not creative i'm not an artist so artistic talent and creativity are not the same steve jobs was one of the most creative human minds in history at least recorded history that we know of and he was not an artist or he was but he was not painting on canvases this guy didn't even know how to code a computer you have to really acknowledge that everything that he brought it was ideas that were crazy and he figured out how his team could actually implement and create what he was thinking about so steve jobs was a mark creative like mm, a handful of people in history you know have done like Elon Musk it pisses people mm. off but he's extraordinarily creative and he has done PayPal and X.com and Tesla and now he's launching rockets to outer space and this guy does not have a science uh, specific you know like uh, rocket science degree right degree he, or anything yeah. what he is is extremely creative and so this is what I really have my intent on this book is teaching people that this is within you there have been tons of studies that have analyzed children when children are just between the ages of four and eight they are extremely creative 98 percent of the kids are creative and then when they reach like the fourth grade they start slowing down their creativity and why is that because there have been more um, formal education, uh, you know, the ways of teaching things. And it's like, oh, this is done this way. And this is what happens, right? And so we have been inserted in an educational system where things are not creative for the most part is they teach us what to think, but they don't teach us how to think, right? Like the how to think. And uh, so all this myth and all this, uh, erroneous conceptions is what have kept people from actually investing and believing in their own ideas, no matter the field, no matter what you do, it doesn't really, that's irrelevant. What I think that it's important is people should know that creativity is an amalgamation also of skills, right? It's like, it's a little bit of risk taking, it's a little bit of being empathetic, because I have a hard time believing that anybody can actually be successful if you don't understand your market, if you don't understand your customers, if you don't understand your boss or the company you're working with, like, if you're not empathetic, it's hard to be creative, because you have to have a feel for what people around you are clamoring for, are feeling, or what what is it that will also get them going, right? And so that's why it's so important for anybody who wants to do something that is disruptive, that is innovative, to be very attuned to the here and now, because the here and now is what it's the compass, right? It tells us what is it that people are asking for. And so, uh, you know, this all this combination of human skills, paying attention is very important. Having the time to sit down in silence with your thoughts and ideas and process them is very important. I mean, when was the last time? I mean, I guess people have had a lot of time, and I hope so, since this pandemic hit us to have more time to think on their own, right? But uh, sometimes people would call me in these companies and say, you know, we feel so stuck in this and that. And I was like, when was the last time you guys took time off? When was the last time you guys went on vacation? Or even if you didn't go on vacation, do you take time off your desk every day to go and take a walk? That It's not actually reading the emails that you just like left your computer and you picked up your phone and you just went to listen to more of work stuff. And like, and people actually look at me surprised because the little fixes that you could potentially incorporate in your life are cumulative, right? Like with time, you see the accumulation of positive things happening to your ideas and your brain just because you took a 10 minute break in the middle of the day to go walk without your phone and your, you know, podcast and your things. So, wow, people uh, have unfortunately gotten into a little bit of what you said before, which is an automatic way of living. 
And once you've mm -hmm. gotten into an automatic way of living, then you can also be replaced by machines because you're not bringing a lot to the table. Yeah, I mean, I think that's it. The the even the time in the pandemic, a lot of people filled it with Netflix and scrolling on their phones and other things that are not creative or refreshing. And so all of that just continues to build up. And I think even for I know it was it's true for me that I am lucky to have a job where I have a lot of vacation as well. And even a week long vacation is not enough for me to actually get back into creative juices that so much has been drained out of our life and so much stress and pressure that it takes three or four days just to get back to neutral. And then maybe you coast a couple of days in neutral and you start worrying about going back to, to work and you never get into that positive energy state of like, oh, I'm actually bored, but I have all this creative energy built up now that I need to put somewhere and I can, I can put that into creative work. I think it really takes a lot longer than people think. I think they take maybe, you know, 30 minutes of, of a walk or something. And that is nice for recharging, maybe getting you back to neutral, but that's not enough to spur the type of creativity and, and innovation that we're talking about here today. And I, I wanted to ask you more about that too, because I feel like what most people miss is that there is actually a return on investment for this, that it's not that if you create or you go play or uh, you work in whatever your passion is, that you're going to make less money or that you're going to be less productive. All of the research shows that you are way more productive, that there's this 80-20 rule or the Pareto principle that yeah. if you come with energy and passion, you work 10 times faster and more creative and innovative and successfully than somebody who's drowned working, you know, punching the button and, and frustrated and burnt out. They, you slow down so much as a human being in these sort of assembly line processes that you're not, you're not producing much. So you can actually, uh, you know, they've done the studies on the four day work week and, and stuff uh -huh. that people produce more when they work four days instead of five. Uh, and you're like, well, that can't be right. Uh, you're like, no, it is. <laughs> when you take another day off to rest or come up with a creative idea, you find a solution that doesn't take as much work and you, you can produce more. I don't think people realize that. So how have you seen that in the business world and the business of art and stuff that you don't necessarily have to work harder uh, to find higher levels of success? You know, I think actually the pandemic demonstrated that, right? Because people had to accommodate and work from home for the majority of people who actually work in offices and they got the job done anyway, right? And so they didn't need to be with somebody breathing on their necks to actually do what they were meant to do. If you would walk around any open space floor anywhere in the United States where people sit down in cubicles, most of the time it's wasted, like surfing the internet and like being on their phones and not really working. Because if you think about it, it seems a little unnatural and almost impossible that somebody sits down and for eight hours straight, they just can't produce work. Right. That is something that I find is even in my better days of like being an attorney, I never I mean, I had to build hours, but it was not like a consistent eight hours just being, you know, like like crazy typing. And no, mm -hmm. it was it was more like, OK, look, I mean, you pick up the phone, you talk to somebody, you send an email, you send a text, you do this, you do that. You walk, you grab a coffee in, in the kitchen and then come back. And so it's a lot of pushing papers. And so that is the truth and the reality of most people who work in offices is not not they are 125 percent committed to just churning out work right and so that mm -hmm. means that work weeks as we know them and the time you spend working are going to be reframed and as we go through the new models of work right and so what you said before about the great resignation is a big concern of companies because they are losing talent because people are burnt out and so there is the the other part of what I was saying before is that because people can't really be focused and churning at work that is great for eight hours and they their um, work days expand tremendously right and that's why we have bankers who are maybe for five hours expecting an email or a phone call young bankers right in, in investment banks and then 
they don't get it until midnight. And so that's why they are burned out is because yes, they have a lot of work, but it's not necessarily coming in chunks that they can manage and they can process it. And also there are weeks where things are not happening and then you have a deal and suddenly everything comes in. And those things are very unproductive at the end of the day. They hurt people. It creates a lot of burnout, obviously. They are not creative. And it, it's just bad culture overall, right? It's like a company and any business mm -hmm. can be defined by the culture. And so this is culture that has been ingrained for centuries, honestly, in the United States. It's gotten worse with technology because people feel that now that you have all this technology, you can actually produce faster and you can respond to things faster. And the truth is no, because the human brain is the same human brain, right? And so it's not, <laughs> right. not because we have this much technology. Yes, we are smarter in a way, in a way but not necessarily because we have technology. We are smarter because we have a lot more resources and we ha and whomever has the willingness to apply themselves to those resources, like which I believe people have to spend more time reading good things and learning good things. I love Netflix, but I also think is it can be, you know, the rabbit hole forever. Like you can just be forever and there is a principle for people who want to be creative that it is create more than you consume. And if you yeah. want to have a balance of, of what it is that you put out, just create more than you consume. Consumption is not bad as long as you put more time to create things, to uh, actually be productive in, in a positive way, right? And so that means that, you know, perhaps instead of like spending, you know, five hours on Netflix, which is so much fun, I'm not denying it, it's excellent, right? Then use, uh, you know, two hours to actually write something interesting on your computer or use two hours to actually think about problems and have, you know, sketches and notes in your notebook and things like that, right? Or like anything that is actually producing rather than consuming. And I yeah, know this is I mean, hard. Yeah, it, it is hard. I mean, Netflix is a, a good way to rest, but it's not a great way to recharge or to energize or, or participate in your life. I, I look at it as like a timeout, you know, it's like sometimes we do need a timeout. And also, I Absolutely. think it depends on how you use it. I love to watch documentaries or other creative shows. I, I love the explained uh, series on Netflix and other things where I feel like at least I'm learning something if I'm going to to check out and lay on the couch here for a couple hours. Uh, but there there's a lot to that. I love what you said, uh, though, about um, the passion and, and finding fun or, or music or art that energizes you that, that you really are passionate about. So my last question for you here is what's on your fun bucket list? What what do you still want to accomplish or what gets you energized uh, to get up and keep look i want this message to be spread around the world to the point that you know everybody knows it right and i think that that's kind of like my mission is right now right i mean besides a, a company that i love and i love working with my clients i think that i'm in like this place where i want the writings that are in the teachings in my book to actually reach everybody in the world because I am invested in fostering this culture of entrepreneurships, people who can actually think on their own. Uh, the idea of critical thinking, but not just the idea of critical thinking just to go against, right? But like, we cannot just believe everything that comes to us without taking yeah. a, a stance, right? I mean, and this was something that is, is one of the, it, or it used to be one of the most interesting and attractive qualities of America is that there was at some point diversity of thought, right? And so now it's like, if you're not one thing, you're canceled. If you are the other, you're canceled by the other side, right? That is very dangerous actually for progress society and for creativity to say the least. What actually gave me a lot of hope is that it, the statistics say that in 2020 and 2021, we got about 25% increase in the amount of filings for new businesses in the country. And this uh, has nice. not happened in about 40 years to be like that the curve of new businesses had declined because businesses got bigger and bigger and bigger and with the Netflixes of the world and the Amazons of the world and the Googles of the world they probably employed everybody right and so um 
when the pandemic hit, people started questioning themselves, right? And so this is what the Census Bureau is uh, giving us and the Small Business Administration is giving us all the statistics. And so that is incredibly important for America to retain a competitive edge to, because that means a lot more people are thinking differently from what their employers told them, from what the system says, from what the handbook, you know, says. And so I, th that's my thing now. I really want you guys to go get my book, uh, how creativity rules the world. I am offering great bonuses, you know, free access to my course if they just pre-order the book. And so that is what I am after. And I really am extending an invitation for people to actually think differently starting now. <laughs> I love it. Go to mariabrito.com slash book. The link is in the show notes there and check out Maria Brito's uh, work there as well. So uh, do you want to play a game? I do. All right. We are uh, spinning our wheel here. And uh, you got awkward questions. Uh, all right. Awkward questions Ooh. is one of my favorites. I have three here for you. What's the most disgusting thing you have ever eaten? Ooh, um, hmm, I eat well. You know, when I was little, my father took me to a place where they had a special turtle kind of uh, pie, like a chicken pot pie, but it had, it was made with like turtle. Yeah. Disgust. Yeah, but I, it's disgusting. <laughs> I have, I, I don't, I have no idea what it tastes like. I've heard people uh, do that, but that's one I've never No, no, tried. I mean, like, I don't, don't try this yeah. at home. Okay, no, please. I yeah, mean, no. Don't do that. No. No. Uh, would you get an implant that allowed you to communicate mind to mind with people if it was available? Yes. <laughs> you would? Yes. Really? Uh-huh. Uh, why is that? <laughs> uh, because, you know, I want to see what people are thinking. I'm very good at controlling my thoughts, right? But I just want to <laughs> ah, see what go. people are thinking, you know? That I like that. That's a good answer. Now, here's the tough one. I give this one to a lot of people. I think it's uh, it's pretty easy, though. But uh, if you could choose to have a child who was ugly, but very smart or good looking, but kind of stupid, which one would you pick? <laughs> oh, my God. I would just have a child who is healthy. And, uh, you know, that's that's what I have. I have two healthy kids. So I would have a child who's ugly and uh, yeah. smart because we now have amazing plastic surgeons and things like that. So, you know, maybe this child will be so smart to figure out how, and honestly, who cares really? That was my uh, answer. It's, it doesn't uh, really that was matter. It doesn't matter. I just feel that it's, it's an unfair question because it's so radical, right? It's, it's very like, yeah. oh my God, no, it doesn't matter. It's just, you know, as long as kids are healthy and they grow <laughs> and they change. You know. Sometimes, uh, you know, being somebody I consider myself smart, uh, I do sometimes think ignorance would be bliss that maybe if I just, uh, you know, didn't think about any of this stuff and just <laughs> went and ran my life that 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 wouldn't be the worst thing in, in the world. Maybe I would be happier some days, but uh, I'm sure you're lucky enough to have children that are both good looking and smart uh, like <laughs> yourself, which is a Thank great deal. You. So uh, we will wrap it up uh, on that. You uh, completed all three questions. You already mentioned uh, the book. Is there anything else we can do to, to help you or what you have going on or any way you can help us? Well, look, I mean, um, get the book, uh, spread the word, reach out to me if you have any questions. I'm always happy to hear from people. And what can I do to help you? Well, I tell you what, uh, you and anybody listening is just keep sharing this message with people that need to hear it. I think um, that's really the goal of Playful Humans is exactly what you mentioned, to help adults rediscover this creativity that you mentioned we lost when we were kids and the, the power of play. And so share this episode with somebody that needs to hear it. Somebody that, that needs the uh, the reminder or the confidence to go out there and, and make things happen. I think there's a ton of us out there. Also, if uh, you have not hit subscribe yet, make sure you subscribe wherever you're listening to this one. Uh, and we will send you more episodes. Now go play, everybody. Don't wait for tomorrow.